Name something you see in every scary movie. Come out to the coast, we'll get together, have a few laughs. Tokyo Electric Power Company, or TEPCO, has released data suggesting the seriousness of the accident at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant. The nuclear fuel from the number one unit is gnawing into the bottom of the containing vessel. During a government-sponsored study meeting on Wednesday, the utility and several research institutes made public their analysis of the melted fuel rods at three of the plant's units. TEPCO says the worst estimate suggests that 100% of the nuclear fuel from the unit number one melted through the bottom of the reactor and much of it fell into the containment vessel. The high temperatures of the fuel eroded the concrete. In the worst case scenario, TEPCO says the molten fuel may have reached 65 centimeters deep between the concrete and a protective steel plate. The thinnest part of these barriers is only 37 centimeters. We can't come to a conclusion from one investigation. We must analyze it from various angles. This analysis is just a first step. The utility and the government plan to analyze the data further to decide how to remove the molten fuel and move towards decommissioning. What's the problem? I haven't got a problem. I've got fucking problems. Plural. Early last week, the government of Japan released its IAEA report on the event. The report indicates that all three reactors of the cores, to some degree, are ex-vessel. The NRC staff has contemplated this scenario for some time. Uh, due to the duration of each of the reactors uh, went without core cooling. However, it's still too early to tell, and we don't have specific evidence to show uh, the exact condition and how much of uh, any of the cores went ex-vessel in those three units. And it's important to realize that uh, as uh, more and more new information comes available, and I think this will continue for months, uh, to come, our understanding of the specific events and what actions need to be taken will be further refined. Oh, the war must come for it. Gentlemen, you can't fight in here. This is the war room. Government leaders in Fukushima want to decommission all the nuclear reactors there. They've wrestled with how to satisfy electricity needs ever since the nuclear accident in March. They're drafting a reconstruction plan that does not depend on nuclear power. The government leaders have been drawing up their blueprint for reconstruction. They want to meet a deadline set for the end of this year. They agreed to propose the decommissioning of all 10 nuclear reactors in the prefecture. Tokyo Electric Power Company operates all of them, including four at the Fukushima Daiichi plant that survived the tsunami. Residents worry TEPCO will lay people off if all the reactors are decommissioned. And they worry that could influence TEPCO plans to compensate people affected by the nuclear accident. As usual, you got us in some serious shit here. For I just don't know what we have to do to make these government interlopers happy. They tell us to make a safe cigarette, we do it, and then suddenly... That's not good enough. Might as well be living in Russia. Mm. Damn straight. <coughs> <coughs> you know, this morning I got a call from our competitors at Brown and Williamson, and they're getting sued by the federal government because of the health claims they made. Yeah, we're...
the waters off Fukushima are some of the most fertile fishing grounds in all of Japan. And Captain Tadayoshi Tadokuro has fished them for 40 years. In all that time, he never imagined a catastrophe would not only take away his and his crew's livelihood, but would also turn the ocean into a threat. These days, when his men put down their lines, it's to collect samples for the government to test for radioactive cesium. It's really hard for us. We used to fish throughout the year, and everyone enjoyed eating our fresh catch. Now there's no happiness left in our lives. Nobody knows just how much radioactive material has spilled into the ocean, but here is a comparison. During the peak of the Chernobyl incident, 1,000 becquerels per cubic meter of water was detected. At the peak of Fukushima, it was 100,000 becquerels. It was first thought currents would swiftly dilute the radiation. At this testing lab in Fukushima, results from the samples of fish are proving otherwise. Some are registering cesium levels of up to 15,000 becquerels, 30 times the government limit. And scientists say fish species and other marine life that spend their time closer to the ocean floor are showing even higher concentrated levels, suggesting contamination is seeping into the seabed. <laughs> Because the contamination is staying on the sea floor, the situation is going to continue for a long time. Unless it is removed, it will climb up the food chain. The big worry is how it will impact fish at the top of the chain. Tuna is a multi-billion dollar industry and the most prized in Japan. Because fishermen are traveling 900 kilometers out to catch the far roaming species, it's legal to fish for now. But even tuna is starting to show traces of cesium. We're anxious. We don't know how much cesium we will see. We don't think the government knows what to do. Unlike contamination on land, officials say they have no answer as to how to rid the vast ocean of the radioactive fallout. That leaves coastal fishermen fearing it could be decades before they're allowed to return. By then, they say, their way of life will have long disappeared. Steve Chow, Al Jazeera, Fukushima, Japan. Japanese representatives at the UN Climate Change Conference in South Africa are working to sink a Made in Japan treaty. They're pushing for a new framework to replace the Kyoto Protocol. NHK World's Susuma Kojima is in Durban to tell us why Japan is opposed to keeping Kyoto alive. It's very simple. The Japanese representatives say the Kyoto Protocol is not a fair system. It covers only 26% of the to total emissions in the world. The US and China, the biggest carbon emitters, have no obligations to reduce their CO2 under the treaty. Japanese leaders are arguing that in order to stop global climate change, it's crucial for all major emitters to get on board. Their fear is that if the conference decides to extend the Kyoto Protocol, places such as Japan and the European Union would shoulder the burden. Another issue that's affecting the Japanese position is the country's March 11th nuclear accident. The government doesn't want to commit to a specific CO2 reduction target right now. Nuclear power was expected to play a significant part in reducing Japan's carbon emissions. But now the government is reconsidering the targets it set and can't make any promises right now. Well, today's announcement by the Japanese cabinet doesn't take anyone by surprise. The government has said repeatedly over the past couple of years it is against an extension of the Kyoto Protocol. But Japan is facing opposition from a number of developing nations at the conference in Durban. These countries want to continue their Kyoto obligations beyond 2012. Some delegates from developing nations are showing concern about the Japanese stance. We know, we know Japan doing a lot, but you know, at least that would, that would be a blow to the spirit, to the whole global spirit, if Japan, you know, uh, really take the position to move out and not, not support us. It's a very bad decision, a decision that will encourage other industrialized countries. It is very sad a Kyoto Protocol member will be pulling out while we are still trying to get everyone to join the treaty. Most developing countries believe the success of these climate change talks depends on whether wealthier nations can commit to their targets under the Kyoto Protocol. 
it is not only Japan, but also other industrialized nations that are against that idea. Delegates will face difficult discussions in the coming days as they try to narrow their differences. And while delegates talk in South Africa, there's more evidence action is needed. Experts at the UN's weather agency say the war warning of the planet has, uh, warming of the planet rather, has caused Arctic sea ice to shrink to a record low volume. They're also warning of a possible increase in extreme weather events linked to global climate change. Representatives of the World Meteorological Organization spoke Tuesday about their annual assessment of global temperatures. They gave the presentation on the sidelines of the UN Climate Conference. The WMO says the volume of the Arctic sea ice in September was 4,200 cubic kilometers. That's down for, from about 4,500 a year earlier. The WMO says global temperatures through October were up to half a degree above the average of 14 degrees Celsius from 1961 to 1990. The organization also says 2011 was the hottest year on record featuring the La Nina phenomenon, something that usually has a cooling effect on the globe. WMO Deputy Secretary General Jeremiah Langosa says global warming could increase extreme weather such as flooding and droughts. He's urging delegates at the Durban conference to take swift action. We would like them to continue to take uh, account of the fact that the temperature continues to rise and uh, urgent decisions are required to help uh, stabilize that in the future.